So without exception, the world's most consistently successful investors rely on their own multi-billion dollar, independent, sophisticated, conflict-free investment office. And we make that structure available with our $20 billion purchasing power, and we back it up. It's highly cost-effective. And why would you invest any other way? So that's my sort of elevator's pitch. If the best people in the world consistently do this, and you can do it because of this thing called OCIO, when it's done right, then why wouldn't you do it that way? Yeah, absolutely. And just to make, I guess, the concept a little bit less abstract for listeners, can you talk about how you've implemented this in other businesses, how this actually works in practice in the real world? Welcome, Jonathan. It's great to have you on the show. How are things? Well, thank you. Um, you say good morning, but I know it's afternoon in the UK, so it's nice to see you. Whereabouts are you based for the listeners? Uh, we are based in Philadelphia. So i uh, been here for 35 years. Love it. And uh, no plans to change. Yeah, fantastic. Well, on that then, I want to dig into your background to introduce you to the listeners and give a bit of context to our conversation. So firstly, I was reading through your career history to date. And I wanted to ask you about your time in the Marines and more personally, I suppose, how that informed your approach at Hurtle Callahan today. Sure. Well, I'm often asked that question. And I think my answer is having sort of two levels. On the first level, you know, I love being a Marine. Everything in my life really has been colored by the Marines and, and always will be. I like to say that I've been relentlessly pursued by good fortune. And my time in the Marines was really a perfect example of that. So to me, the Marines represent selflessness, serving a cause greater than oneself, integrity, courage, leadership, excellence, a can-do attitude, and importantly, that life is too short to live without idealism. So those are all sort of the background concepts I think I grasp. And on a second level, I think of the Marines as innovators. Marines were really always the, the most underfunded of the armed forces and have a tradition of innovation. We always used to say that we have done so much with so little for so long that soon we'll be able to do everything with nothing forever. So it really required a lot of innovation. And one of my quotes that I like is George Bernard Shaw said that some people see things that are and say why, and I dream things that never were and say why not. And so that's kind of an innovator's view. And there's a great deal of data indicating that innovation often comes from fresh eyes outside an industry. So when I joined Goldman Sachs over 40 years ago, uh, I was really completely new to the industry and seeing some things that never were and asking why not and having this crazy kind of Marine Corps can-do conviction that we could do absolutely anything if we worked hard enough. And all that led to creating Hurdle Callahan, which you know we see as the, the first large, powerful, sophisticated, fiercely independent investment office that's available to serious investors everywhere. And what became it came to be called Outsource Chief Investment Officer. I also see the Marine Corps as a critically important kind of an American institution and prosperous, durable societies are supported by their important institutions. And, and they're not institutions that always existed. Mm. They didn't spring up fully formed. So the Marines were created in Philadelphia in 1775, and nurtured over time. Goldman Sachs started as a small commercial paper dealer. I went to Penn State, my alma mater, which, uh, you know, started as a small farmer's college in 1855 and is now one of the largest universities in the world. Microsoft was started in 75, Google in 98. So they've all become cornerstone American institutions. And I really see our firm as a, an important 21st century American institution. We've been working hard to deliver extraordinary these outcomes for 35 years, and we're well positioned for the next 35 years. So we're here to stay. And I, I think both of those things, you know, the pursuit of excellence, the idealism, and then the, the tradition of innovation all came from the Marine Corps. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's some parallels that we can dig into in regards to your time in the Marines and how that's informed your investment philosophy today. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to circle back and understand, I suppose, whether there was a eureka moment in founding Hurtle Callahan. We speak to a lot of company founders on the podcast and often they can point to a particular moment that inspired the creation of the firm. Was that the case uh, for you? Yeah. Well, I guess I could point out one. Uh, my first day at Goldman Sachs, I asked my mentors, again, Bill Groover, hmm. for the noble cause. So I was coming right out of the Marine Corps and got to Wall Street and said, what's the noble cause? And, you know, I think a lot of people on Wall Street would have said, what do you mean noble cause? This is Wall Street. But Bill was wiser than that. And uh, that's why I think we had connected. He was a partner at Goldman and became a beloved professor at Bucknell University. And he'd served on submarines in the Navy and he knew my question was serious. So without missing a beat, he answered the client. And that response says a great deal, I think, about Goldman Sachs in those days. Once again, I was relentlessly pursued by good fortune, surrounded by smart, hardworking, 
client-centric professionals in this highly competitive, but also highly professional culture. So with all the support of the firm, I set out to do great things for clients. But our results were mixed and not for lack of trying. The head of the research department in those days was a guy named Bill Keeley. And he helped me wrestle with what I saw really as a conundrum. I was working hard at what I believe was the greatest investment firm in the world, but was producing mixed results for clients. How could that be? So Bill began introducing me to higher level thinking about portfolio construction. And I was fascinated by that. And about the same time, my partner, a guy named Scott Miller, introduced me to a fellow named Arthur Miltonberger. And Arthur was the chief investment officer at the R.K. Mellon Family and Foundation. Good fortune again. Uh, Arthur was operating out of this bucolic town called Ligonier, Pennsylvania, and was consistently outperforming Goldman Sachs. He was the first truly talented CIO that I ever met. He was leading a small but independent office responsible for about three and a half billion dollars, I believe. And that's still a lot of money, but it was really a lot of money in those days. So client was my noble cause. I had been introduced to a better structure, a better way to serve them, the independent office, but it was not broadly available and I could not create it at Goldman. And so that was my eureka moment, I think. Yeah, fantastic. And it's not often we get a chance to speak to someone that's been through several market cycles invested across a couple of decades at least. And I guess what I'm keen to understand then is kind of the context in which you now approach today's market. So has your experience, for example, of the October 1987 crash shaped how you approach today's markets perhaps? Well, there are always parallels and differences. Mm. You know, some people say that the four most dangerous words in the history of investing are it's different this time, but it's actually always different. And we use an analogy here of bridge building. So the, the Newtonian physics associated with bridge building never changes, but the site changes, the stress factor changes, and the purpose of the bridge changes. And then also the materials that you use to build the bridge are innovated over time. So before structural steel, and we had to build only stone bridges, you know, we had limitations. When structural steel was introduced, you know, you had to incorporate that into design, but that does not refute Newtonian physics. So it's always the same and it always changes. So there's always parallels and differences. And it's important not to use history to try to predict the future, but to use it kind of as a foil. What is similar? What's different? You know, what does that mean the wise path going forward is likely to be? Nobody knows for sure. It's really a, a game of probabilities. At 87 was a, was a really a jaw-dropping wake-up call. The Dow Jones dropped 22% that day. So that would be like a drop of 7,500 points today. So if the Dow went down seven, you know, 7,500 points today, it would get everybody's attention. But the situation was not similar. 87 crash was largely triggered by a Wall Street the introduction of a tool called portfolio insurance that created an automatic dynamic hedging, a process of dynamic hedging, which in a nutshell means that as a portfolio value rises, you buy more stocks. When it falls, you sell stocks. So you can see in retrospect how that would lead to a cascading effect. But the world was vastly different in those days. Derivatives were still a novelty and market mechanisms were not really sufficient to deal with the volume and volatility they could create. So the situation was quite different, but there were lessons to learn. Yeah, absolutely. First one I would say, just if you want me to keep going, Hayden, is um, to watch out for unintended consequences of new products, philosophies, and regulations. Mm. So people will see an innovation and they see the advantage of the innovation and it may make a lot of sense, but what's the unintended consequence? And so in those days, you know, the idea of dynamic hedging made a lot of sense, but when everybody tried to do it at once in a market that wasn't set up to deal with the volatility, we had a problem. So that's one. Um, and today I think about wrestling with cryptocurrency. What does that mean? How is that impacting the world? Clearly the interest rate shock that we just went through, and it wasn't an increase, it was a shock when you think from going interest rates tripling mm -hmm. in a short period of time, and that caused a lot of problems at banks because of the way they were investing their collateral. So these are all, you can look back 10 years and look at the mortgage crisis and how securitizing debt is a very interesting idea with a lot of logic to it. But if it goes too far, then you've got a problem. So it's this notion of trying to look for unintended consequences. The second is to, to, that I really take out of 87 was not to be fooled by randomness. You know, Nicholas Taleb, who gets a lot of credit for writing The Black Swan, but his first book was called Fooled by Randomness. And I actually think it's a more significant book. 
Um, but there were people in 87 that got credit for predicting the crash. And most notably was a woman named Elaine Garzarelli, who was a strategist that was a firm that was then Shearson Lehman Brothers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because buyers, every day the market is made up of buyers meeting sellers. So in a sense, everyone who purchases something, there's not in a sense, it, every time you purchase something, someone else is selling it to you. So there's two sides of that trade. Yeah. And one of the two is going to be right. You know, they, they bet right. Or do they just happen to pick the winning lottery ticket? In other words, it was just random. And so I don't think there's no doubt that Elaine Garzarelli was, was and is bright and a well-prepared analyst. But her performance in, quote, predicting the 87 crash really did appear to, in retrospect, be more like a winning lottery ticket. So everybody, there were people long in the market and positive, and there were people short the market and negative. And the one that happened to be that day that the market went through this technical crash, in my view, based a lot on this uh, portfolio insurance, and she was celebrated for that. Her subsequent performance after that really didn't justify the confidence that that post-crash money flow to her firm warranted. So um, I think that's one of the real lessons is look back at that 87 and you saw it again, really, in the mortgage crisis. Um, the guy slips my mind right now, the hedge fund guy who was so right for the mortgage crisis, and he's really done nothing since then. Michael Burry, was it? So, um, yeah, I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure. But anyway, those lessons are definitely incorporated into our worldview, but today's market bears little resemblance to 87. So yeah. I wouldn't draw the too tight an association with the two periods. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess... Well, of current investors, I suppose, will be keen to hear from you is how you apply that knowledge, that experience, that context to today's markets and specifically in relation, I think, to the market cycle. You've invested through five separate decades, I believe, and multiple market cycles as a result. So where are we, do you think, in today's market cycle? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the market cycle is important. Howard Marks, who's a great author and a, and, a, and a friend, wrote a book not too long ago called Mastering the Market Cycle. Uh, market cycles are inevitable. Now, interestingly, the inventory cycle, like a lot of times the business cycle, has been muted over the past decades. It's returned a little bit more recently, but a lot of it was muted because of the supply chain inventory innovations that were created, interestingly, by Walmart. Walmart is really the organization that gets most of the credit, and, and we really became relying on just-in-time inventory. Mm -hmm. And so in the old days, you used to build up inventory and then people would sell it, they'd work it down and then that would be a trough and then you'd build it up again and they'd work it down. And, you know, before the last 10 years, before COVID hit and supply chains were so stressed, we really got to a place where firms didn't have a lot of inventory. And so they didn't, the inventory cycle was, was mitigated. That's now being rethought. And my guess is that we'll have some sort of a something in between so that the business cycle may return to some degree, but not like it used to be. So we'll take the lessons of just-in-time inventory and uh, modify them based on the potential for a supply chain shock like we went through with COVID and think how we put the best, all that knowledge together to, to have the to most predictable cycle. So that's the business cycle. The market cycle is related. The problem is that the books all portray the cycle as this elegant symmetrical sign curve. But it's more often a muddle that is only discernible as a curve in retrospect. So right now, we're continuing to kind of muddle forward. In retrospect, we'll probably look like late in the cycle. So we're late in the cycle. The important question is not whether we have a recession. They happen. The important session is how deep will it be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, when you get late in the recession, late in the economic cycle, and you're starting to look at something like a recession, going forward from that point is where a lot of money is made. Once you get through that down period and you're starting to see things come back and the prices don't reflect it yet. So this is, it's always a muddle. It's not clear that where you are in the cycle until after the fact, but our sense is that likely we're kind of muddling through toward the end of the cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, but that, what does that mean? So today we want to be fully invested in stocks because publicly traded bonds still do not offer compelling returns. And we want to take full advantage of what we believe is exceptional returns still available in private markets, especially private credit, private equity, venture capital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we remain optimistic. It is likely that there will be the coming pain in commercial real estate in the United States will create opportunities. For example, for a firm like ours, where we have access to true experts, you know, th that are needed really to find the exceptional opportunities among the wreckage. Mm -hmm. 
we manage $20 billion and we've been doing it for a long time. So we've got access to terrific specialist managers. And we have been and will continue to be talking to those managers about opportunities and specifically what's going to happen in commercial real estate. And is there a way to make money there? Yeah. Fantastic. I read a report from Fidelity before the call, which largely agreed with your assessment. I think, you know, they reckoned we were late cycle. They reckoned the likelihood of a recession in the second half of this year was high. But yeah, I mean, that was my question to you. I think, you know, how how deep is that recession going to be? How significant is that economic slowdown going to be in the US, do you think, in the second half of 2023? Well, I think we're only, that's another one we're only going to know in retrospect. There are too many moving parts. It's too much of a dynamic. One of our favorite quotes here is that, you know, there are two types of forecasters, Mm -hmm. those who don't know and those who don't know they don't know. And so we like to be in the second camp. You can't really predict. You can prepare. So this is a key concept. Don't predict, prepare. And there's so much in the media that's trying to ask people to predict, which in the world of infotainment is way more entertainment than it is information. Mm. So if we look at all the forecasters, another line is if you got all the economists in the world and lined them up head to foot, they wouldn't reach a conclusion. So if you get two of the smartest people you know and put them in a room and they completely disagree, how do you go forward with that knowledge? So we really want to prepare. And what we're doing to do that is find as many individually compelling opportunities that we can find and then combine them in a way that mitigates the cyclicality of the portfolio, the volatility of the portfolio. So that's what we're going to do. And and we think we're well positioned today and um, no way to predict how deep A, if we're going to technically get into a recession, and B, if we do, how deep it will be. But at each point in the cycle, there are investment opportunities. And the job of a chief investment officer is to find them. Absolutely. Okay, great. And um, the majority of our listeners are are stock investors, stock market investors. And with the Fed uh, announcement due tomorrow, interesting time to obviously have this conversation. Do you have any thoughts about what the likely impact on equities that announcement will have in the medium term, I guess, till the end of 2023 again to use that time frame. Yeah, I guess I'd summarize it by saying not much. Mm -hmm. Uh, The market is very efficient on assimilating all everything that's known in the market. So public markets are just amazingly effective at that. So that only something that is currently unknown can significantly move markets. And the Fed has been careful and deliberate going out of their way really to telegraph everything they plan to do. I remember when Alan Greenspan was the Fed chair. And we used to talk about Fed speak. People had to try and interpret what the heck he was talking about. It was so convoluted and cryptic. Mm. That's not true today. So they're transparent, they're deliberate, and they're trying to not surprise anyone. So a surprise is unlikely. Nothing's ever absolute, but the probability is low that the outcome of this meeting is going to move markets significantly. Interestingly, in the United States, the last two days have been big days in the market, moving positively up, which, you know, common sense tells me that that would mean that the inflation report that's coming out in the federal government. Some people already have seen that report. It's going to be announced. You know, it hasn't been announced yet, but some people have seen it. My guess is the market movement would indicate that that's going to be a positive news because it's been leaked somehow. Mm -hmm. Somehow the the word's out that this number is going to be a little better. Mm -hmm. And so my guess is this next decision, whichever way they go, isn't going to move the market too much fundamentally. I guess the sentiment right now is that they're going to pause. So if they didn't pause, you might have a dip. Yeah. Because there's a big difference, uh, Hayden, between trading and investing. Yeah. And so a lot of times what people do, they make a mistake. If, if the Fed didn't pause, the traders would probably try to get short right away because they believed that the market was going to move against them. So market could go down and then people would ascribe fundamentals to that. But it actually wasn't fundamentals. It was just the trading of that day and traders trying to close their long positions. So my guess is that this meeting isn't going to have a lot of impact. Most of the information is out there. We understand that the Fed is trying to walk a tightrope between inflation and recession. And it's a very hard job, by the way. Mm. But, you know, they're doing the best they can and they're very transparent. So my guess is it's going to be not much of an event tomorrow. Yeah. And I completely uh, take your your point about the distinction between trading and investing. It's a really important one. I guess one that I want to address now, uh, if we are speaking to kind of longer term investors, uh, of which the majority of our listeners are, from an asset allocation perspective, you mentioned potentially being overweight stocks versus bonds, for example. But in terms of within that stocks, that stock allocation within your portfolio, um, I'm interested to understand whether you think there are significant 
differences or divergences between the potential performance of US equities versus European or emerging markets, for example. Do you have any kind of thoughts around whether there will be a divergence between US equity performance over the next sort of six months versus, let's call them international stocks? Do you have any thoughts on that on that subject? Well, we are still overweight US. What it really has to do with is the companies that are in the United States. So we've been overweight US for quite a while. And it really, I remember years ago, you know, I mean, five years ago, our performance was very strong and, and we were underweight Europe. But if you looked, for example, at if you stripped out the large technology companies that are in the United States, and if you kind of matched up industry to industry, you know, Europe has more banks and industrials as a percentage of their business. And if you just stripped out the technology and looked at our uh, remaining portfolio of banks and industrials, our performance was right in line Mm. with Europe if you take out the currency effect. So we still believe that these high quality growth companies that have a moat around them where their competition is hard continue to be where we want to be overweighted. So we are overweight those names and we're overweight U.S. because we have a preponderance of those names you know, they globally operate out of the United States. That doesn't mean we're not invested overseas. We are invested overseas and we, w- we are always invested overseas. One of the key concepts of portfolio structure is that if you maximize the breadth of your opportunity set, that's a huge mathematical advantage. So if you and I have the same skill, for example, in basketball and you get twice as many shots as, you know, looks as I do, you're going to have a higher score. So that's just maximizing the breadth. So skill times breadth equals success. So we want to maximize the breadth of our opportunity set, which means we certainly want to look at a global market. In emerging markets, there are a lot, always opportunities. You know, it's a different world, but we still invest in China, for example. And it's an interesting thing to think that China only represents, it's the second largest economy in the world, but it only represents about 3% of the all country world index. So it's too significant to be ignored. Mm. And so we're invested there as well. I would say, that, you know, when we think about what might move these markets, Because you never want to act so sanguine that there's some sort of a certainty that the markets are going to muddle higher. Because, you know, you can always have a change in the trend of earnings or in interest rates. So those two things, if they really changed, would change the environment we're in. The other thing is some sort of an exogenous event. I mean, the world is not without global risk right now. And so you never know what's going to happen in that regard. And so these predictions always have to be you know, contemporized or modified or, you know, in the sense that no one should think they're certain. Mm. The best money managers in the world are right about 60% of the time. Mm -hmm. So you got to remember that you can make the right decision, but if it's a 60-40 and you've always got to lean on the 60, because statistically that's the only way to go, but the 40 happens 40% of the time. So the notion that approaching the market with certainty is a fallacy. So things can happen. But meanwhile, we want to continue to do all the hard work we're doing to just capture high returns. And our client base is, are all serious investors. Going back to your point, Hayden, about investing, the difference between investing and trading. Mm. So these are philanthropic families and mission-driven, and the mission-driven institutions that they love. Mm. And our important work is to strengthen those philanthropic families and mission-driven institutions so they can do more of the great work that they're doing to support our society. But we're definitely focused on investing and not on trading and certainly not on gambling. There's more gambling in the market today than it has ever been. And what we do is real investing and it works. Yeah, absolutely. That is for sure. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. And there's a few particular points I want to pick up on. And I think the best place to do that would be to move into a broader discussion about the outsourced chief investment officer model, which of course you founded and pioneered. So firstly, perhaps before we move on to the specific points, can you succinctly summarize the concept, perhaps give us the, the elevator pitch? Well, the three key benefits that I would say on an elevator pitch, or let me, you know, let me take a step back. So every serious investor wants high returns with low risk. You know, the idea of high returns with high risk is unappealing because when you say it's high return with high risk, that means the likelihood of achieving the high return is actually quite low. That's why it's risky. So what we want and all serious investors want is high returns with low risk or high returns with high certainty. And we want that because if we get that, then our clients can provide more security and you know more research, more scholarship, and basically more human progress. 
So that if we run money, that's what happens. If we run money well, that's what happens. If we run it poorly, the opposite is true. And we just believe in general that worldwide, money is not being managed in aggregate as well as it should be. And so the world's most sophisticated, successful investors do not rely on banks or brokerage firms or investment product firms to capture high returns with low risk because the conflicts of interest limit market access and really cast a pall over the recommendations. In other words, if you recommend that I put more money in venture capital, is that because you really believe in it or because you're going to make more money on this venture capital product? And so if your asset allocation recommendations impact your compensation, then you're not conflict free. And none of the great investment shops in the world would ever put up with an internal staff that had those conflicts. So without exception, the world's most consistently successful investors rely on their own multi-billion dollar, independent, sophisticated, conflict-free investment office. And we make that structure available with our $20 billion purchasing power and, and we back it up. It's highly cost effective. And why would you invest any other way? So that's my sort of elevator's pitch. If the best people in the world consistently do this and you can do it, because of this thing called OCIO, when it's done right, then why wouldn't you do it that way? Yeah, absolutely. And just to make, I guess, the concept a little bit less abstract for listeners, can you talk about how you've implemented this in other businesses, how this actually works in practice in the real world? How OCIO works? Yes, exactly. Well, first of all, like, what are we, what are we out for? We're out for doing three things, high returns with lower risk, So how do you do that? That's sort of the holy grail. And then a program that is custom designed specifically for each client. That's key. And then delivered personally with a perspective of high integrity, perpetual professional organization that they can count on. So many corporate organizations come and go. Their agendas change. You know, we've been in business 35 years. Uh, We're well positioned for the next 35 years. And so there's consistency and and delivering success with, with a high degree of certainty. And then confidence, we want the clients to understand, have the confidence that they have an apex investment program, relying on the same approach that every single one of the world's largest, most sophisticated investors use. So, and by that, I mean that you have that conflict-free agent working directly for you, which means better fees and terms, wholesale access to different making specialists that you really have to earn that access over, over time. And it makes it possible to consistently, and that's a key word, achieve exceptionally strong returns. It's really a far better, better model, an authentic OCIO. And I would I'd just like to qualify that because a lot of people are saying they do OCIO, but they're really not. Really, for the first time, made that approach available broadly. So that's what we do. Now, how we do it is it's a complete program. And first of all, I'd start out by saying very few people understand the role of a CIO. Yeah. The CIO is like the master investment manager, the overseeing investment manager trying to deliver complete program success. So the first thing we got to do is to define what success means. Somebody said to me, what's the first step? And I said, planning, planning, planning. And I guess that's three steps. But um, it really, you've got to start if you're going to achieve success with certainty and it's client specific, you really have got to have exceptional planning. And that's both with our families and the institutions. So we're really start with that notion of defining success for you. I think of an analogy, you know, if you are a triathlete, and you have a fitness program and you're 25 years old, that's a different program than a 65-year-old golfer who's trying to maintain flexibility, but they can both have successful programs. So the key is to understand the challenge and to invest to solve that challenge with a high degree of, of certainty. And so we start with this planning process and really understand each client's perspective. And then we get into, you know, the second step is really starting with an index core. I mentioned earlier that, you know, we want to use the all country world index as our default. Mm -hmm. So we want to start with an index core that is global and we want to use an investment grade bond portfolio indexed as our fixed income uh, default. We really see the world as having three types of investments, growth oriented investments, which is all the equity, both public and private, income oriented investments, which is bonds and so forth, and then hybrids or diversifiers, which is a combination of the two. So convertible bonds, things like that have aspects of both bonds and stocks in them. We want to maximize that. We want to start with that index core. And then we're going to do dynamic asset allocation. So I mentioned that, you know, before you ever get to a manager, we're really talking about overweighting U.S. versus non-U.S., shortening the duration of the bond portfolio. And those kinds of asset allocation decisions that can both manage risk and, and enhance return. The fourth key concept is you never pay active management fees unless you're paying it to people with the skill and the degrees of freedom 
to really add value net of fees. And that's a big one because people don't really understand how active managers operate today. And the vast majority of managers, given the constraints that they're operating under, cannot earn their fees. So that's a key. Don't pay fees to active managers where you're not, you have no, statistically, you have a very low likelihood because of the way they run money and because of their fee structure that you're going to net something higher than indexing. And then the next thing would be is, so, so you're really looking for what I would call high conviction managers. And I can talk about that uh, later if you want. And then the next thing is, and you really rely heavily on the inefficiencies of private markets, including at least private credit, private equity, and venture capital, and then also co-invest, which is almost the best opportunity within those spaces if you do it right. And then finally, you know, you pay attention. You don't miss a beat. You use disciplined, informed, ongoing evaluation to watch the changing world to watch the changing managers, and to watch an evolving client needs to deliver that success with certainty. So it's a multi-dimensional aspect, multi-managers, global, custom-designed program. Yeah, fantastic. I think that's a really detailed overview, and you've already touched on it, but I think it's now an opportune time to dig into your investment philosophy. I listened to your interview with uh, Ted Sides um, on the Capital Allocators podcast, a former alumnus of this podcast, actually, as well. I spoke to Ted a while back. And you discussed the, the fundamental tenets of your philosophy. So perhaps you can highlight the core components for us. Um, and then I've got a few that I'd like to dig into. But yeah, give us a sense of what the core components are. So given what I just said, that's how the course begins. Yeah. And it's, you know, starting with, a, with an index core. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, starting with the planning, really defining success. That planning process, by the way, is welcome and revealing to the clients themselves. Mm. We find it's just tremendously revealing when we go through families. One of the things we do with institutions is we sit down with a committee and really go through a risk waterfall to prioritize what the risks are. And oftentimes, the primary risk, I would say, you know, 90% of the time, once you have that serious conversation for the institution, it comes out to be mission failure. Mm. So much more than short-term volatility or credit risk or anything like that. The number one risk is mission failure. And once you get that alignment, then you can really do the things in the program that are going to increase the likelihood of success. Start with that global core. Make asset allocation and be humble about that notion of can you really predict, you know, how U.S. is going to do versus Europe, for example. I mean, if we're right 60% of the time, we're in the Hall of Fame. So you got to be humble about that. And the other thing is to make incremental decisions. So not big bets because we are managing all the money for people. Mm -hmm. And so you might have one manager who's doing things that are extraordinarily, you know, that are strong, that express a strong opinion that are either going to win or lose. That's a great manager to put into the portfolio if he, he or she is very talented. But for a CIO, you've got to think about total program success. So incremental decisions along the way. Watch the fees. You've got to really watch the fees. Fees matter. Mm -hmm. And so we're never going to pay fees to a manager that we don't believe is going to create value net of those fees. And then look for inefficiencies. This is really where I would say, you know, you start to really add alpha. People talk all day about what's going to happen to the Fed meeting and how do I get on the right side of that trade? And that's not really a winning game. This predicting what's going to happen next is not a winning game. The market is too efficient. There are too many players. There's too much dissemination of information. Traditional managers that mostly you see as sort of consultant approved, and I'm thinking about, you know, U.S. equity managers, Mm -hmm. just to use one subset, they tend to hold a large portfolio and they tend to have low tracking error. So let me me go back for a minute. I'm going to take one more thing. And that is when you talked about these managers with high convictions, you know, There are a lot of things that you do in an investment program Mm -hmm. that is just the reason you have success is you're cutting through noise and nonsense. And a lot of times the nonsense is actually portrayed as accepted wisdom. So let's start with some nonsense that's related to this notion of high conviction managers. Mm -hmm. In 1974 in the United States, uh, the government passed a law called the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which is known as ERISA. Mm -hmm. And it was right after two really bad years in the, in the market. And so the government stepped in and they were going to do something about it. And uh, as with so many laws, it had this far-reaching unintended consequences. It made corporate officers liable for the prudent management of the pension funds, which in turn created the pension fund consulting industry. It created the 401k industry in the United States, probably good things. But it also transformed pension investing from primarily a return on investment challenge to more of a CYA challenge. 
they really were preparing to be sued by the Department of Labor. And what program could they defend if they were being sued because they were now liable for the prudent management of the pension fund? So that in turn led to part of that CYA system was a term called tracking error that closely monitors how closely an active manager tracks an underlying sub-index and then penalizes them for too much variance from that index. Well, that's nonsense. That's the kind of thing that may be appropriate for ERISA investing when you're likely to get sued, but it has little relevance when investing for families and endowments where it actually destroys value every day. Without differentiated behavior, certainly greater than 2% tracking error, you can't get differentiated performance. So we love high conviction specialist managers with true skill and a sustainable edge who have real tracking error. They're hard to find, which is why you need a great team of active, experienced experts looking for them. And you got to search high and low for them. But we crave that manager that has a real edge, a sustainable edge, true skill, what we call alpha. And we really are searching for those managers because they're the ones that make the difference in the market. You can also create differences, create inefficiencies in the public markets by having a management period that's maybe a three-year lockup. So people can't, there are a lot of people who won't do that. Well, that tells you it's likely to be inefficient an inefficiency. So look for ways to create inefficiencies in public markets and then look for built-in inefficiencies in uh, private markets. So private credit today is an exceptional opportunity set because of what's going on in the banking climate in the United States, the banking industry, many high quality borrowers are taking advantage of the private credit market. So you've got very strong collateral producing high returns. This is another area though, where it's not, you know, it's not a do it yourself kind of a project. You know, you really need to be represented by real experts in the marketplace. The private credit is inefficient. Private equity is inefficient and venture capital is often really inefficient. When I was in the Marine Corps, we used to always say, never get into a fair fight if you can avoid it. Well, in venture capital space, if you're with leading managers, in a lot of ways, it's not a fair fight Mm. because they're getting the first look at all the most innovative uh, companies and ideas that are, you know, coming out in tech space, for example. Mm. So that's when we spend a lot of our time is looking for those inefficiencies in the market. A lot of time planning, index core, shifting asset allocation on the margin, and then looking and creating inefficiencies in the market so you can sustainably create outsized return. Yeah, fantastic. And before we move back on to some of the other components of your approach, um, I just wanted to dig into your manager selection process, I suppose. I think it'd be interesting for the listeners to understand how that works in practice. You know, there's obviously characteristics, criteria that you work to to identify the strongest managers. But talk to me about more specifically what those are and then how consistently use those to identify the top managers? So the key notion to consider is unexplained performance. Now, going back 30 years ago or 40 years ago, we used to talk about the four Ps, people, process, portfolio, performance. And, you know, it sounds a little cute, but it actually covers things pretty well. Mm. Number one, you don't want to ever deal with anybody you don't trust. And the people have to be articulate and they have to be committed to what you're doing and they have to be transparent. There are too many good people functioning in the investment uh, world for us to compromise on the quality of the professionals who are going to be responsible for client assets. So number one is people. Second thing, and this is actually, I'll come back to this in a minute, the process. How do they actually do it? And there's a lot of detailed discussion there. Portfolio is to say, okay, given the processes you just articulated, Does the portfolio that you own today and have owned reflect that process consistently? Are there inconsistencies? And then the final thing is performance. So it's actually backwards from what most people look at. Most people look at managers because of their performance. Uh, We look at that last and we rarely respond to incoming calls from managers because we're really using our network of managers to find other great managers. Uh, We might find, you know, who are you investing your personal money with away from your firm? Sometimes great professionals, there may be a team of great professionals that spin out of one firm and go to another Mm. and they work together and we think they've got a niche that's going to be terrific. Going back to this notion of process, we want an uninterrupted chain of compelling logic. So we want to know what they do first, then second, then third, then fourth. And if there's a space in there, a trust me moment, we don't like that. We want to see it being as articulate and disciplined as we can. And then what we're looking for And this is where I think we do more work than many firms, 
we really have done work with, you know, factor analysis for decades. And what we know is that if you look at a, a high a manager, for example, over the last decade before this bear market started, if you look at the ETF for tech stocks, QQQ, mm. uh, that was, you know, consistently one of the best performing assets that you could own. And it's just an index. So if you look at a manager and you say, this is a sort of a simple comparison of how we actually do it, but it's similar. Mm. Uh, if you look at the manager who's in tech space and you say, and you compare him to the S&P 500 and he's crushing the S&P 500, that gets people's attention. But if he's in tech space, you really ought to compare him to QQQ, not to the S&P 500. And so there's a, you can do that and you can refine the comparison and refine the comparison and refine the comparison. So what you have is a lot of managers will have certain risks built into their portfolio mm. that we can replicate with an index. And we find that most of that replication, just that style replication, that fact replication defines their performance pattern. So if they own tech stocks and we can create a tech index for a fraction, a few basis points, uh, oftentimes they will actually will not outperform that index. Or if they do outperform it, it's much less and maybe below after fees, it's nothing. So this notion of looking for residual risk, what is it they're doing? Somehow we can't explain how they're outperforming. They're doing something different and we can't replicate it. And that looks to us like true skill. They've got something going on. They've got information flow. They've got industry expertise. And they've got just a certain skill set that can't be replicated. And that is true alpha. And that is valuable, scarce, and sometimes fleeting. But what we are looking for when we look for those managers, given the four Ps, like just forget about just, that's, that's just table stakes. You got to have great people. Process has to be well articulated. Portfolio has to reflect the process. And the performance has to go up and down when that process and that portfolio is likely to go up and down. Mm. And so there's a consistency there. But then go back to process and say, what are you doing and why is it different and why is it likely to continue to outperform? And that weeds out, by the way, the vast majority of active managers in public space. Very few managers, when analyzed properly, can actually earn their fees. Yeah, fantastic. I'm glad we dug into that. Um, and I guess a, a related question then is back to those key or core components of your philosophy or approach. You mentioned, I think, concentrated long only uh, as a component of your approach when you spoke to Ted. Well, perhaps you can describe how that kind of fits into your approach and the mix there. And then perhaps you can explain how you balance that with effective risk management as well. So historically, what the consulting industry or ERISA portfolios would do is they'd put together a group of managers and they would say, each manager cannot have more than 2% tracking error. And by the way, a rule of thumb we have here is that a great manager will get a 20% return on their tracking error. So if you have a 2% tracking error, that means you should outperform if you're good on average over time by 40 basis points. So there's a lot of ifs there, but if you're good, and you, know, and you have 2% tracking error, you can outperform by 40 basis points. So what's their fee? 38 and a half. So the 40 basis points is before fees. Yeah. So it ends up you're not beating the benchmark if you have 200 basis points of tracking error. So what we would rather do is create an index. We want to control our tracking error, portfolio tracking error. If a client needs to not vary too much from the benchmark, we can do that with an index fund. Mm. So we want the active managers. And one thing you said, Hayden, is concentrated long only. I would say high conviction yeah. long only. Okay. And sometimes they're not long only, by the way, but high conviction. Mm. And so we want these high conviction managers that have a great deal of tracking error because they're acting differently. They have an edge. And so we combine those high tracking error, high value added, high conviction managers with an index. And then we, we can get whatever amount of tracking error and outperformance we want. I mean, it's, that's the more intelligent way to do it. We're saving our active fee budget for the people who can actually earn it. Yeah. And we're using indexing to mitigate volatility or mitigate variability from the index. So that's how we look for these guys. And that's how we put it together. Yeah. Oh, I know it's a fascinating insight. And I think that covers off your investment philosophy and your overall approach. But I want to finish with a question that is the same for all guests that appear on the show. And I'm particularly interested to get your thoughts. And we ask all guests what their next big idea is, the, the name of the show, 
we can see on the pack shot, invest in the next big idea. So we're interested to hear from our guests what they think that is. And for some of the guests that we speak to, it's it's a theme. It could even be an individual company or a particular type of strategy. But if I put that question to you and perhaps something we can leave our listeners with, what is that one idea? What's your next big idea that you can leave our listenership with today? Well, I have one that's maybe more topical, which I mentioned already, and that is commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate, you often, when you find outsized returns, it's always, you know, ride to the sound of the guns. I mean, where's the dislocation in the market? And lots of players in that market are just running from dislocation. And so there's opportunities to to take advantage of excess return when people are acting emotionally Mm. and not rationally. The other one I would say is we still believe that software is eating the world. Mm -hmm. So venture capital and private markets, most people look at private markets in an aggregate portfolio and they're constrained by their tolerance for illiquidity. What we do a lot with planning is to explain to people that they have a lot more tolerance for illiquidity than they think. Mm. It's sort of a knee-jerk reaction to think, well, you know, I'm 100% liquid and therefore I've got a low-risk portfolio. Well, that The low returns, relatively low returns uh, associated with liquid portfolios may risk your mission. So if your number one risk is mission failure, then the liquidity that you are so comfortable with may actually be riskier than the illiquidity if it's well-placed, if it's well-placed, if it's (laughs) well-placed. And that wasn't a mistake. That is so key. The private markets... Um, are very, are not uniform. There is a huge distribution of returns out of private markets. But if you can be in the top quartile or decile of, of managers in private markets, the excess return over public markets is significant. And so in a sense, you can think about if it's a 5% excess return over the total portfolio, then in a sense, you're paying 5% a year for your liquidity. Mm for that privilege of holding liquid assets, which can have a very negative effect on mission. So we really want to challenge people to say the best run programs in the world, the most high performing programs in the world, some of them are 50% private equity. Mm. So 40% private markets, 40 or 50% private markets. There's a whole notion in behavioral economics called anchoring. And what happens is if people are anchored to zero on private markets because they've been raised in this world of public markets, Then if you can get them to 10%, it's a victory. Well, if you have 500 basis points over the rest of the portfolio coming from your private portfolio and you get 10% more, you've just increased returns by 50 basis points, 10% of 500. That's good. But if you get it to 30% or 40%, then you're really moving the needle. So why not anchor on 50% and then move downward? Say, nah, 50, we can't do 50. 50 is way too illiquid. So how about 40? Nah, still too illiquid. So where you anchor, do you start at zero and work up or do you start at 50 and work down? And if you can execute that through the right organization, that's a big if. Uh, and once again, statements about private markets are, are very, um, you got to be careful because when you have a, a, an asset class that has almost no bell in its bell curve, you know, like the normal distribution There's no bump in the middle. The mean, commenting about means doesn't mean much Mm. when your curve looks more like a symbol than a bell, right? So in in the world of private markets, in a sense, the alpha dominates the beta. It's more about the manager than it is about the asset class. Mm. So you've got to be with the right managers. And that's hard and it takes years and you got to earn access. And by the way, it takes years to build a program. You can't just snap your fingers and have these exposures like you can in public markets. So start with that core program, that public market core program, and then enhance it with these variations um, that I've listed. And, um, and so the two I have today is I'm really curious about commercial real estate and how that's going to shake out. A lot of people are looking at it, so we'll have to see if there in fact are, you know, the opportunities that ought to logically present themselves. And then the idea of Uh, private markets, and specifically uh, software, I still think are the most compelling long-term ideas that that we have. Yeah, fantastic. And a great insight, I think, to end on. Uh, That just leads me to say thank you very much for joining us on the podcast, Jonathan. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, well, let me just say just one more thing, Hayden. I want to say that we're really uh, committed to this, to the firm as an institution. Mm -hmm. 
this 21st century new kind of institution. And we're very much looking for like-minded professionals to join us. So, um, you know, we've got an amazing journey. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're well suited for the next 35 years and uh, we're looking for, looking for people to join us. So um, we're excited. Yeah. Fantastic. And thank you very much for asking me to participate today. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I've learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners have as well.